The Soviet space program has achieved many firsts in space, but the world knows surprisingly little about what happened. So today we're going to address that a little. And to do this, we're joined by the legendary Colin Burgess, who released a book last year called Soviets in Space, Russia's Cosmonauts and the Space Frontier. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know. You can do this via our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. Please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 130 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to the Space and Things podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. I've read two very, very good articles this week. One about Apollo 9 astronaut Rusty Swikart. And one about the opening of Space Mountain. And I believe they were written by someone called Emily Carney. Have you heard about her? Ha! Yes. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you very much. I really appreciate those kind words. Yeah, I wrote an article, and I, I hope uh, if Rusty's out there, I hope he likes it. But uh, it's about what he did during the 70s. And it's really cool. He, I feel like he's always been one of the most under-discussed astronauts. And I think it's time he sort of gets his moment in the spotlight. It was a lot of fun to write it. There was a lot of fun articles to look up about him and stuff like that. And the Space Mountain one I talked about, I think, on last week's episode a little bit. Yeah, it was basically how Space Mountain has the ride at Disney World. And there's also a one at Disneyland. It's a little bit different, but same idea. But it basically it has linkages to like real space, like astronauts went to the opening of the ride and and things like that. And plus, I love Disney, so it was kind of a an excuse for me to combine Disney and space. So those were both a lot of fun to write, and I'm hoping to have a lot more uh, pieces out this year. So we'll we'll see. Well, I'm really enjoying the Space in the 70s series, and I'm looking forward to where it goes. I like that you cover the culture side of things as well about uh, and putting things in perspective of the 1970s you, the way you talk about the fashion and even things like Disney I like that you bring it all together it makes it more fun and the 70s there wasn't much going on in space flight so it's great that we're also learning a lot about what was going on because obviously there was stuff going on it just doesn't get talked about as much as it should do yeah that that's the thing like um I wanted to make it sort of fun, not just, you know, clinical, like in the 70s, all this stuff happened. The 70s in spaceflight are not really discussed because there weren't a lot of crewed flights from the U.S. at the time, right? Yeah. But I've tried to put some stuff together to emphasize, yes, spaceflight was happening during this time. And there were kind of some fun pop culture-y linkages between spaceflight and other things. So I'm hoping to explore more of that this year. Well, I look forward to that. Okay, on to this week's main feature. So, the Soviet Union is often portrayed as the enemy when we talk about spaceflight. So let's put politics, diplomacy and war to one side for a moment. The Soviet Union achieved incredible feats in the world of spaceflight and was the leader in the field for a number of years. No matter what you say, this is a fact. It continued to clock up many spaceflight firsts, even after the so-called space race, when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon in 1969, was over. Between 1957 and 1988, they achieved 40 firsts in space. And some of them are pretty important ones. Obviously, the first satellites, the first probes to the moon, Venus and Mars, the first object to land on the moon, Venus and Mars, the first man and woman in space, the first man and woman to perform spacewalks, the first space station. And who can forget the first fully automated flight of a space plane? Just to name a few. Yes, I I think that (laughs) Space plane is called the Buran or something like that. I don't know. I've heard about them before. Anyway, yeah, a few times, just a couple times. Not very often. I don't know if you know this, Emily, but actually that there's some left in an abandoned warehouse. Really? Over (laughs) over in Kazakhstan. Wow. There's there's some amazing photos on the internet of these things. You really should check it out if you've never seen it. Wow, this is brand new information. (laughs) I've never heard of this ever okay wow 
<laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we had to get that out of the way for some of the diehards Absolutely. who know what this is about. <laughs> yeah. While we have spoken before about some of the achievements of the Soviet program in our interviews with Stephen Walker, we still think there's a lot more to discuss. Fortunately, Colin Burgess wrote and released a book last year called Soviets in Space, Russia's Cosmonauts and the Space Frontier, and that has given us the opportunity to take the time to learn a little bit more. Yeah, Colin Burgess is a name you might have heard us mention before because he is the creator and editor of a series of books which we think are wonderful. The series is called Outward Odyssey, A People's History of Space Flight and is published by the University of Nebraska Press. The series now has over 20 books with some of our favourite authors, Francis French, Jay Gallantine, Richard Jurek, David Hitt, Richard Houston, Michelle Evans, to name a few. So, of course... We will be asking about those as well. Colin has written so many books and not just about spaceflight either. So be sure to check out the show notes to find links to all of his works. He lives in Sydney, Australia. So this interview was conducted while we were in different days of the week, which was pretty cool. So uh, anyway, roll the tape. Welcome, Colin, and thank you for joining us so early in the morning over in Sydney. Uh, We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. So firstly, a little bit about you. What got you interested in spaceflight? Were there any notable formative events that led you there? Yes, there were, Emily, and and good morning from Sydney, Australia. It, It goes back to 1961, and I had no real interest in space activities until I stayed over... Christmas with my grandmother and uh, she was a great historian and she used to go on quiz shows and what have you and she encouraged me to study history and at that time she said there's an event happening right now that you should look at which is a chap called John Glenn he's going to fly around the earth three times and it's going to be a very significant event in uh, world history So uh, she went out and bought me a scrapbook and we would go and buy the newspapers and cut out articles about John Glenn, which I've still got. And uh, that started me being interested. And after a while, she also said, well, here's my typewriter. Why don't you write to the Mercury astronauts? And to me, that was an unbelievable thing to do. I mean, that's tantamount to writing to God. I mean, you know, astronauts, Australia, it was just unbelievable. Anyway, I wrote uh, these letters, and uh, about three months later, uh, this letter arrived from Houston with a signature of uh, Gus Grissom at the bottom of a letter, which sadly I found out later on was a secretarial signature, but it didn't matter. <laughs> it, it, it thrust me into this passion of a lifetime, and then, I, of course, I fully studied Scott Carpenter's flight, and it just blossomed from there, Emily. Awesome. Man, I love that. I wonder how many people are out there with... Uh secretarial signatures on letters and they have no idea and uh, and think it's a it's the real deal but it's still so cool though isn't it oh yes very much in fact uh other letters did drift in most were signed with auto pens but uh scott carpenter and john glenn both sent me lovely letters which were personally signed amazing amazing Wow. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump forward to uh, your writing then. So your your books frequently go into unseen dimensions concerning spaceflight. Your newest book is no different. It's called Soviets in Space and discusses Soviet spaceflight that might be obscure in the West. What inspired you to take on this topic? Uh, well, first of all, uh, it was a proposal that was put to me by publishers in England for a series of books called Cosmos. And in fact, the first book they asked me to write uh, turned out to be The Greatest Adventure, which was an overall history of space exploration right through to uh, when the uh, Russians launched the movie people into space just uh, a a few months back. And then they also asked me to write a book about purely on the Soviet-Russian side of things. 
And uh, it, it's something I tackled with relish because that's my go, that's my thing, is spaceflight history, particularly pertaining to the early pioneering days, the, the days which meant so much to me when I'd pick up the daily newspapers and learn about the newest space venture or I'd uh, walk past a news agent and see a headline saying three Soviet cosmonauts in space. They were exciting times. There was a race on. It just nurtured me all the way through all those years. But uh, writing about that in these books took me back. It reinvigorated my passion for the story of the Soviet space program back in those pioneering days and the, the cosmonauts who did those extraordinary things, the pioneering things that uh, led to greater achievements in space exploration. Why do you think that Soviet achievements are often overlooked within the spaceflight community? I'm not even talking about amongst everyone, but specifically within the community, I feel like less people know the names of cosmonauts or their achievements than they know about their American counterparts from the same era. Oh, obviously it had to do with the, the competitive nature of those years back when there was a race to the moon simply because a lot of the uh, Soviet names, uh, Nikolaev, Popovich, uh, Vyotistov, uh, Tereshkova, they were hard to pronounce. And they were competing against astronauts called Glenn, Carpenter and uh, Slayton. So, uh, but of course, the press leaned towards the American achievements and the fact that they were always trying to prove that America was head in a space race, that uh, their achievements were far more technologically advanced than the Soviets uh, and the engineering and the basically the achievements in space far outstripped those of the Soviets. So the Soviets got pushed back into the background a little bit as far as reporting was concerned. And uh, of course, back then you had uh, Life magazine, you had Time magazine, and who would go out and buy Soviet life? Nobody, <laughs> uh, except me. So uh, <laughs> the reporting was rather one-edged towards the American achievements and uh, I, I guess that was part of the interest that uh, I took on was identifying these flights, looking at what they actually did, because there, there, there was very scant uh, reporting of what occurred on these flights. And it wouldn't be uh, sometimes years until you learned the specifics of what really happened. Like, who knew that uh, Yuri Gagarin nearly died coming back to Earth? Uh, his spacecraft nearly burned up in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, the mystery of the cosmonauts, the missing cosmonauts, that was uh, something intriguing that uh, hit the press for a while. And uh, who who died in space? There were all these so-called uh, reports of Soviet cosmonauts dying on space mm -hmm. missions before Gagarin. There was always a mystery to solve. There was always intrigue. And... Uh, I, I was just fascinated by it, and, and this is still reflected in writing books such as Soviets in Space. So what is perhaps your favorite story from your newest book about uh, Soviet spaceflight history? I've always had a passion for telling the truth about the flight of Vladimir Komarov, the ill-fated flight where he died. There's been a new book out, I won't discuss the, the author or the title, but the author takes us back to the rumours that were prevailing back in the 1970s that Komarov died a screaming mess, yelling at the Soviet hierarchy, his space chiefs, uh, saying goodbye to his wife. None of this happened. And it always annoys me that the so-called historians don't investigate the facts. They go back to conventional chronological data from the 1970s. and it's totally wrong because Komarov was actually an amazing cosmonaut. He was brave. He took a mission that had a lot of faults. I believe there were over 200 or 300 faults in that spacecraft, the Soyuz 1, when he took it into orbit. But he prevailed. He overcame some of the problems, but he couldn't prevail over a solar panel that wouldn't extend. Uh, his spacecraft was in a bit of trouble. He tried everything he could. He used all his experience in trying to rectify the whole situation, but in, ultimately he was told to return to Earth. Everything was fine up until that point. He re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. No problems. 
Now, as, as for talking to his wife, well, you all know about how communication, once re-entry occurs, is just blocked. You can't talk to anybody. Nobody can talk to you. So this, this whole rubbish, uh, and it really is rubbish, about him screaming and yelling at the Soviet hierarchy is it, just unbelievable. And the fact that he didn't know he was going to die until a few seconds beforehand when his parachutes, when his parachutes tangled and he slammed into the earth. His wife was hundreds of miles away. She wasn't in mission control, as they say. But this whole episode upsets me. Uh, it upset me at the time, but it upsets me more so nowadays because it is falsely reported and it is denigrating to a very brave cosmonaut. Absolutely. It's very frustrating when you read any book and you know it's basing its story on myths. When you were writing this book, did you uncover anything that you didn't already know? How extensive was your research or were you drawing on years of research that you've done over the years? Well, in the early days of Soviet cosmonautics, uh, obviously, uh, I know a lot about it. Uh, I can background it very easily. I have all the background material. Uh, I even have, as I said before, my scrapbooks from those early days. And uh, it is only some of the more recent activities in which I've made discoveries. Uh, I, can't, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to pick up where Soviet space activity has been in the last few years, what's happening, what the goals are, the interaction between uh, the Soviet cosmonauts and the or the Russian cosmonauts now and uh, the Americans is something that is quite interesting. The fact that uh, what is going on in the world below doesn't necessarily translate to what's going on in orbit. Uh, there is still detente. There is still communication. They still have shared activities. You learn a lot about the philosophy behind the current space activities as carried out by uh, the people now in orbit. And what do you think was the crowning achievement of the Soviet space program? Uh, was it something obvious like Sputnik or Gagarin, or do you think there is another achievement which trumps that? Oh, I think it was a, a series of achievements. Uh, obviously, Sputnik going into orbit, uh, catching the West by surprise, or, you know, maybe not so much surprise, but... Uh, it, it certainly woke the country up to the fact that the Soviets uh, sent up this satellite into orbit and uh, immediately newspapers started speculating on the fact that it could carry some sort of a, a weapon that could be dropped down on America. Children in school were given lessons on how to duck underneath their desks in the case of a nuclear warfare, <laughs> which seems to us quite ridiculous now. But then, of course, launching the first man in orbit, the first woman in orbit, the first... Two cosmonauts were launched within a day of each other from the same launch pad. Three cosmonauts in orbit at the same time. There were so many of those achievements. And we can readily understand how these came about because simply because the Americans would announce their program in advance. They would say, we're going to do this. The uh, Soviet chiefs, space chiefs would say, OK, let's go to Korolev. And they would say, right, the Americans are going to do this. What can we do to better that? And they would say, OK, America wants to uh, put a man into space and have him exit his spacecraft. Uh, and here's the timeline. Let's train a cosmonaut, get him outside of the Boschkot spacecraft and have him do the same thing before the Americans. They sent a woman into space many, many years before America even contemplated hiring female astronauts. It was a case of one-upsmanship. And uh, at the time, everybody believed that the Soviet space program was far and away superior to that of the United States. It was only during the Gemini program where we started seeing catch-up, where America was achieving rendezvous and, and such activities with ease that uh, the Soviets started falling behind. And of course, at that stage, they had plans to go to the moon, to uh, send a cosmonaut onto the surface of the moon, which they had to give up simply because America pulled ahead. They had superior technology and engineering. And of course, we uh, also witnessed the Russian rockets exploding during launch. 
Do you think that Sergei, I hope I'm saying his name right, Sergei Korolyov deserves more uh, global recognition? Oh, absolutely, Emily. Uh, he was the, well, in a, in a sense, the Werner von Braun of the Soviet space program. Uh, he had an amazing life. I mean, he uh, was taken during the Stalin's reign of terror, sent to the gulags. Uh, he nearly died there. In fact, he picked up problems that would later shorten his life. But he came back and single-handedly launched the Soviet space program. Werner von Braun was restricted in what he could do and what he could say. Uh, Korolev was the go-to guy. Anytime Nikita Khrushchev wanted a space spectacular, he would go and see Korolev. Korolev would talk to his design bureau. They would come up with a solution and they would carry it through to launch and orbit. And, you know, he was just an amazing, mystical guy who was never recognised in the West during his lifetime. It was only after he died that the identity of this mysterious chief designer and even photographs of him were released to the Western press. Uh, an amazing guy and uh, single-handedly launched the Soviet space program. Absolutely. So as of right now, the, the Russian space program is embattled and it's been the victim of several leaks in a short period of time. So what are your thoughts on the on the modern Russian space program? Do you think the Russians have as much of a desire to be world leaders in spaceflight like their Soviet predecessors? Well, it's a good question, Emily, and, and one I can't answer. Uh, you probably you know, have the similar ideas to me. We just don't know. At the moment, things are ticking over. The programs are working well. The launches are going well. Yes, there are leaks in, in the spacecraft, but these are things that um, teach us how to overcome these problems. So at the moment, who knows what's ahead of us? We know that the lifespan of the International Space Station is finite, that uh, one day they are going to have to abandon it. And where do we go from there? Do the Russians go to uh, China and start taking part in, in their program there? India is about to send up some cosmonauts at Space Station. So uh, who knows what's ahead of us? Uh, we only know what we read. A lot of it is conjectural. Don't know is the, uh, is the answer. Uh, at the moment, things are going along nicely. There's cooperation and there's friendship between the, the crew members uh, of all nations. It does appear that there are friendship between both the cosmonauts and the astronauts and obviously the space agencies as well. Do you think the general public find it harder to celebrate people like Korolev and Gagarin because they are connected to the Soviet Union and also modern-day Russia? Do you, do you think that's actually a problem or do you think it's it's something we can overcome if we try and tell the story like you have in your book of these people, of their heroism, uh, of what they achieved within the world of space? Yeah, well, well sadly, Dave, there's, there's limited interest in uh, early space flight activity. Uh, it, it's only purists and people such as myself, enthusiasts who really know the the full story, I mean, uh, if you went to uh, anybody in the world apart from Russia and said, who is Sergei Korolev, 999 out of 1,000 would have no idea. Mm. Uh, Yuri Gagarin, oh, yes, first man in space, what do you know about him? Nothing. They know more about a lot of the early American astronauts, particularly John Glenn landing on the moon, <laughs> which is, <laughs> is often thrust at teachers by school children. Um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, early space activity, I mean, we're talking 60 years ago now. It's it's ancient history, whereas it's it's history that I lived through. And, uh, you know, you are learning about it yourselves. But I, I think that uh, a lot of these pioneering people are forgotten. Uh, look at the number of people in the American space program who, whose names were commonplace back then in the newspapers. Uh, and now nobody could name any of them. We have to look back at history to learn what's going on in the future. But I don't know. I, I love looking back at space light history and pointing out what these people, these individuals, these groups, these bureaus, these pioneers, these rocketeers, these forward-looking people did as far as space light is concerned and, and bringing us to where we are today. 
Yeah. Okay. Let's change the subject. Uh, we, I think that leads <laughs> us on actually quite nicely to this. Um, so although Soviets in Space uh, is not part of this series, you began the University of Nebraska Press's Outward Odyssey series, which has yielded many classic and indispensable books, including Into That Silent Sea, which was written with our friend Francis French. Tell us the story of how, how all this came together. Right. Well, well, first of all, thank you for those very kind words. Uh, uh, I'll take you back to the, the very beginnings of the uh, Outward Odyssey series. And it, it traces back, you might think curiously enough, to Krista McCormick. After Krista died in the Challenger tragedy back in 1986, of course, I felt aggrieved like everybody else. And then in, I believe it was the year 2000, her mother, Grace Corrigan, put together a book called The Journal for Krista. And I liked it so much, uh, it really touched me that I wrote to Grace. And we started up a communication. And at one stage, we were going to... Uh, just go on a holiday to uh, the New England area on the on the East Coast. And I got in touch with Grace and she said, oh, look, if you're coming over, please come to Framingham. Uh, I can put you up, you and your wife. And at that stage, I had an idea of writing a book for older students around uh, talking about Krista McAuliffe and the, the legacy of the Challenger disaster. And... I communicated this to Grace and I said, look, if you could find me a publisher, uh, I will donate all of the proceeds from that book to the Challenger Education Fund. Well, she took up the challenges. She did with a lot of challenges. And she went to her publishers, who were the University of Nebraska Press, and said, uh, this friend of mine, Colin Burgess, is putting together a book about my daughter and the Challenger legacy. Well, they accepted it. I wrote that. Uh, and under contract, as I mentioned, all proceeds went to the Challenger Education Fund. At that stage, I was also working on a new book called Fallen Astronauts, which talked about the astronauts and cosmonauts who had died prior to the first moon landings. And the then chief editor at Nebraska Press uh, got in touch with me and he said, look, I like both of your books. We are thinking about putting together a series of eight books dealing with the history of human space activities. Would you be interested in becoming our series editor? Now, I have no experience whatsoever in, in the editing process. I, I thought about it for about a minute and said yes. And so we started looking at what books to produce. I wrote down the first few. And then the biggest problem I had was actually finding authors to write these books. Uh, the first mistake I made was thinking I'll find established spaceflight authors. So I started contacting a few and they were all coming back in a, in a sort of a negative way. They knew nothing about the series. and I was a newbie and it was University of Nebraska Press. So uh, they weren't a major publisher. And after I had one episode with one author who wanted a $10,000 advance, Ooh. which, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Nebraska Press laughed at them. Uh, I mean, they're a non-profit organisation, so they, they can't spill out money like that willy-nilly. With that under my belt, I then started looking at finding new authors. And I went to some of the places like Robert Perlman's Collect Space, and I started putting out feelers for people who had some writing experience but would be interested in writing a book that I would nominate about a certain aspect of space light history. And I started getting answers back, but then Francis French and I were talking and we decided we would kick off the series with the first book, which would deal with space flight activities post Gagarin through to the first footprint on the moon in Apollo 11. So we set to work on this and we each assigned ourselves different chapters based on our likes, dislikes, what have you, uh, contacts. And we put this manuscript together and it turned out massive. <laughs> it was huge in volume. <laughs> and we took this to Nebraska Press. They took one look and they said, hey, 
this is just way too big. This this book you've got into that silent sea is just way too big. Uh, you have two options. You can either edit the bones out of it or we could make it two books. So we had Into That Silent Sea. We then decided to halve it, which incredibly came down to the exact middle page of our manuscript and called it In the Shadow of the Moon. So those first two books were produced in 2007 by Nebraska Press. By that time, I had other authors working on other books. And it was a challenging time for me because apart from my friendship with Francis and the fact that we were, we'd done these books together, I was talking to people I'd never met before who had some writing experience, who were trying to write a book for this brand new series. And I had to not only assign book to them and say, would you be interested in writing this book about Skylar? Would you write, like to write this book about uh, unmanned probes and planetary exploration? I had to suss out their interest, their experience, and their enthusiasm for the subject. It was a challenge. It really was. But when the first book started coming in, I thought, I'm on the right track here. I am now not only identifying what subjects these authors should tackle, but I'm creating a whole new breed of spaceflight authors. Most of them had never written more than a few sentences. Uh, one of them had written stories about Craig Breedlove's speed record attempt. And I gauged a lot from what they sent me. And with, with every confidence, I would pass this information on to the Nebraska Press. I would recommend that this author write this book. And the editor there, Rob Taylor, would come back to me and say, here's a contract for them. Go for it. And it's been a massively successful series. I, I'm still amazed. I, I am totally amazed that it came together like this when it started out with so much uncertainty on my part because of a lack of experience in, in dealing with these. But amazingly, next month, March, is the 20th year since I took on that role of series editor. Wow. 22 books have been produced. Uh, they may not be massive sellers, but I've invigorated a whole new genre of spaceflight authors, some of whom have written more than one book. have got people like Jay Gallantine now who is writing his fourth book for the series and concluding the story of planetary probes. And uh, he, he's just been an absolute marvel. And I know that uh, Emily has, has met Jay many times and he's, he's a wonderful speaker passionate about the subject, didn't want the book in the first place. <laughs> he said, "He said I don't, I'd rather write about one of the, the moon landings. I said, look, I, I really need someone to write this book. He started out very tentatively. He went to, I recommended he go and see James Van Allen and have a talk with him, and it just took off from there. Now he's so passionate about it. He's even learned the Russian language because he communicates with all of these Russian people who are involved in the lunar cods and, and other early Russian space program or Soviet space programs. That, that's come back to me. It, it's a sort of a legacy. We've created this series. It's now extended to 22 books. There are another six in the pipeline, would you believe? So at the moment, we're looking at 28 books. Uh, I, don't, I don't know of many other series of books that have, have taken on such proportions. But uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I, you know, 20 years. I may eventually look at handing over the uh, stewardship of the series to someone else because uh, the challenge has, has dissipated in, in a way because I had to find these authors. I had to identify what subjects to cover. I had to guide them through the publication process, the editing process, everything like that. Now I can open up my computer of a morning and someone will say, hey, I've got this great idea for a book. Do you think the University of Nebraska Press would be interested? And it's not only coming from people, you know, who are enthusiasts. It's coming from astronauts, from engineers, from people who are, were close to the space program. And so in, in effect, uh, the whole thing has turned upside down. I'm no longer the, the creator. I'm, I'm basically the intermediary between um, the author and University of Nebraska Press. Uh, 
I find myself with a lot less to do. I'm still reading the chapters as they come to me, but the whole scenario has changed rather dramatically uh, since it first began. But I, I still take great pride and pleasure every time a parcel arrives on my doorstep and I open it up and there's this new series book by a new author. It, it's a fabulous feeling. So one of my favorites that you've written is Shattered Dreams, uh, which is about astronauts and programs that didn't quite make it to space. Were there any stories or a particular story that inspired you to take on that project? Well, I knew Dwayne Grevelin very well. Uh, he, my wife and I had stayed with him in Merritt Island a, a couple of times. And I always thought that what happened to Dwayne with his sacking was a tragedy because he was probably the best qualified of the first group of scientist astronauts that were chosen. But because his wife was uncomfortable with the situation, she decided to sue him for divorce at totally the wrong time. NASA got wind of this, and back then, divorce was you know, a no-no in the astronaut corps, even though a lot of astronauts, as chosen astronauts at that time, were undergoing marital problems. They hid this from NASA. But Dwayne was sacked. It was very, very sad. And, and over several meetings with Dwayne and lunches and dinners, and he told me the, the full story. And, and, in fact, I can't even put in print some of the things he told me about what happened in those days. But I always wanted to tell his story. And it led me to think about people like Paddy Robertson and certain others. And by that stage, I'd, I'd already had an article written about the Indonesian astronauts and how they missed out because of the Challenger disaster. And uh, Phil Chapman, of course, uh, I know that Emily has a particular fondness for the story of Phil Chapman. He, would, he was a brilliant man, but he came into the program at the wrong time. He came into the program too late. There were no missions for him. And to exclude him from his studies for a decade or more just chewed away at him. And in the end, he he resigned. He was also unhappy, of course, with some of the uh, chiefs at NASA and uh, some of the things they wanted to do. But that led me on to other stories, the stories of the, the British astronauts, uh, NASA astronauts who perished. And one thing just led to another. And in fact, I even snuck in a little story about a chap who uh, lost his legs in a flying accident, who was determined to become a Navy. Uh, he was a Navy av aviator and he wanted to become an astronaut. And he felt that not having any legs was no impediment to flying into space. Sadly, of course, in those days, he was refused. It was just one of those great little stories to tell about someone who had a dream, who had a passion, who had the drive to try to see that passion through in flying in space, but uh, never achieved it. And, uh, yeah, I, thank you for saying those things about the book. It is one of my favourite books and uh, followed on really from Fallen Astronauts, which was yeah. a, a similar sort of book, people who never realised their, their dreams of what they wanted to do. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about the, the series, which I think is amazing, is the aesthetics. I love how these books look on my shelf because <laughs> I like that they match. It's a very simple idea. They look classy. They look really classy and they look really good next to each other. Was that a Nebraska press thing or was that something that you came up with or how did that come about? Because I just think these look amazing next to each other. <laughs> you are absolutely right, Dave. Uh, it, it was an initiative of the uh, Nebraska press and their, uh, their art people. I, I actually came up with the name of Outward Odyssey basically because I, one of my favourite authors uh, many years ago it was John Wyndham, a British science fiction writer, and he wrote a book called The Outward Urge, and I'm thinking, outward, outward, you know, and so I came up with the title. But I took that to Nebraska Press, and we started designing the books, and the art people came up with this idea of introducing similar spines with a, with a, a star field surrounding the title, and they would press through with this. There wouldn't be a colour change. There wouldn't be any difference to this, and as you say, I've, I've got the 22 books lined up on my shelf, and they look absolutely wonderful. Yeah. It, it was a great initiative on their part, and, and this was just one of the cooperative things that we came up with. Uh, I only ever went to Nebraska Press one time in, in Lincoln and uh, met all of the people there, and uh, that would be very early in the piece. 
so probably around about 2010, and uh, I've not been back since. But we still communicate. Uh, any problem I have, any questions I have, go to them straight back to me with the answer. And uh, it, it's been a wonderfully productive and cooperative venture. I'm, I'm thrilled with the the books, the appearance of the books, the subject matters covered, and and some of the extraordinary writing some of these people have come up with. Uh, I mean, Jeffrey Bowman's book on, on Ron Evans, which is one of the more recent titles, Jeffrey wrote a chapter for uh, Footprints in the Dust many years ago, and he always wrote, wanted to write another book, and uh, he came up with this idea about uh, writing a book on Ron Evans, and it's one of the most masterful, intriguing, easy-to-read books that I've ever had the privilege to know, and uh, you know, I, I thought Jeffrey would do a, a good book. He did a great book. He did a, a book that would be around for generations. And I thrilled to that for him, for the series, but also for the legacy that these books will leave. You know, when I'm long gone, these books will still be around and people will still be buying them, reading them, learning from them, and hopefully, you know, understanding that they are full of fact and not fiction. And mm. uh, it's been an extraordinary experience all over. I thank all of the authors of the series for their dedication to it, uh, for the scrutiny of the facts, for the fact that they enjoy the process, even though they're unfamiliar with it, and hopefully it will lead to a lot more books being published by these people, and, and that's already started happening. Absolutely. So one, one other thing on, on aesthetics is the titles. They're all really great titles. You have to look beyond the title to find out what the book's about, but they just sell the book so well. I think the only one that has perhaps an obvious title is the uh, X-15 book. The, the, the rest of them, you know, Infinity Beckoned, <laughs> Outposts on a Frontier, Bold They Rise. I mean, they're just great titles. And I think that makes them more intriguing, again, on your shelf. You're not just... Uh, because they are great history books and they're great reference books. I always go to them when I'm researching things for these podcasts. You know it's going to be well-researched and you know you're going to get something that you're going to be able to trust. But on your shelf, they look like epic novels, and I love that. <laughs> oh, no, that's very good of you to say. Uh, uh, in fact, in all modesty, I must take credit for quite a few of the titles that you've mentioned. Uh, many years ago, I, I wanted to write a book about uh, animals in space, and this is well before I, I, I did actually write the book, but I was going to call it Into That Silent Sea, which, uh, of course, is a take from Coleridge's uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And I just thought that is so fitting for a book about space flight, Into That Silent Sea. And then we, Francis and I, had to come up with a very quick title for our halved book, and we came up with the uh, in the Shadow of the Moon, and, which was extraordinary because at the same time a documentary came out called In the Shadow of the Moon and people thought it was the book about the documentary. So <laughs> the sales just soared, which was absolutely marvellous at the time. <laughs> but uh, no, I came up with quite a few of the titles of the books, but then, of course, uh, people like Jay Gallatin would come back and he'd say, oh, I'm struggling with the title. Uh, what do you think of these? And uh, he, he basically named all of his books. Most other authors accepted the uh, title I gave them. Uh, I honestly don't think that Nebraska Pest changed any of the titles. The, the cooperation between uh, myself and the authors and, and the Nebraska Press has just been a great experience, a great ride through, you know, 20 years of publication. Uh, it, thoroughly enjoyable and, uh, as I said, a legacy for years to come. Obviously, you said there's uh, six currently being written or maybe close to publication. Any Anything you can let us in on? Any little scoops? Oh, well, I, I have already previously uh, talked about the six books. There's obviously the fourth one of Jay Galantine. So Charlie Walker is uh, still writing his book about the, his uh, three flights into space back in the early shuttle program. I've got a book being written by some people about the uh, story of extravehicular activity, spacewalking, uh, another one about space participants, and uh, Asif Siddiqui is actually rewriting, grossly rewriting his book, Challenge to Apollo, and uh, he's going to submit this in two different books, uh, wow. one following the other. Instead of a single volume, it's going to be over two volumes, 
greatly updated. It's going to be the, the, the reference book of the Soviet space program, as was Challenge to Apollo in its time, but now he's updating and uh, expanding on that early book. There's some to look forward to. Uh, there's a couple that uh, I believe are just about to go under contract. So maybe the series will go out to 30 books. So uh, we'll wait and see. But I, I'm happy with the books that uh, are being presented to Nebraska Press and uh, that will join the series. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have a favourite? Yeah, the, 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 the books by Colin Burgess are quite extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> the T-Top chapter from Into the Silent Sea, I think, changed my life. <laughs> That uh, chapter was entertaining top to bottom. I was like, how did I not know about this guy? Like, I mean, seriously. So I have to thank you and Francis for that. Because seriously, when I first read that book, I was like, this dude is a, this dude is entertaining. Like, oh my gosh. So thank you. Oh, damn it, Emily. That was Francis's chapter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, it was a, it was a great chapter anyway. No, it was a great chapter we- nonetheless. We each selected a, a favourite subject, a favourite person in, in spaceflight history. Uh, obviously, we'd help each other with different uh, aspects of it, but uh, like you, I learned so much about Gammon Titov that I never knew before. I never knew that he'd been involved in a fatal car accident and a woman was killed and was hushed up. Mm. You know, it, these these are things that I didn't know, but Francis uncovered it. He talked about his passion for, you know, writing and, and the, the masters of literature. Tito was an extraordinary person, but uh, who unfortunately was the first person to suffer from space adaptation syndrome, and uh, nobody knew anything about it then. They just thought that he was, he, you know, had a bad stomach or what have you, and uh, they excluded him from further space flight activity. He was he was a gentle man. I, I met him once. I liked him. I liked his story, but. Uh, the fact that Francis uncovered all of these incredible stories, and, and of course we both did. I'm not, I'm not just singling out Francis's, but uh, the fact that I was able to delve into stories of Gordon Cooper and, and people like this and then cover things about their childhood and, the, you know, what inspired them to, to flying and wanting to join up as an astronaut and the uncertainty about it. And and then we had this chapter, it was called The Two Wallies, comparing Wally Shira with Wally Funk, who was one of the so-called Mercury 13. That, that chapter just came together. And uh, we we didn't think it would work at first, but uh, we thought that Wally would Wally Shira would say, oh, "Oh no, thank you. Don't want to be compared to that person." The whole thing just came together, and and Francis and I look back at that now, and uh, we think we did all of that. Mm. How amazing! How totally amazing! Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you very much for for joining us, and and thank you for. All the work you've done and this current book as well is also uh, a real great insight. I'm glad we came back to, to the Soviet program at the end as well. A nice full circle interview there. I like that. Um, <laughs> so th- thanks very much for, for joining us. I'm, I'd love to get you on again. I think there's a whole episode we could do about the Australian space program. Uh, and I think you could be our man on that. What do you say about that? Oh, yes. Perfectly fine. Yeah, Amazing. perfectly happy. Well, we'll try and sort that out then. Uh, but- <laughs> okay. Excellent. But thank you very much. Thank you, Dave and Emily. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> this is the part of the podcast where I start just just blatantly kissing ass. Seriously, Colin Burgess is like one of my idols as far as being a writer. Uh, I, I think the first Space Fest I met him at, I, I basically had a nervous breakdown in front of him because I was so happy to meet him. Um, for me, it's like meeting, you know, Paul McCartney or something <laughs> like that. So. Seriously, I mean, it's just this guy is like a, a very big influence um, on not just my career, but I think every every space historian's career. I'm very honored he's on our show, and I, I hope that we will see him on further episodes uh, because he is just a fount of information. He's awesome. Yeah, and I really recommend this latest book. It's not part of the Nebraska series. It's a broad overview of the Soviet space program. It's not incredibly long which makes it very accessible. So this is a really good for those people who don't know anything, want to know a little bit more uh, or anything about the Soviet space program. This is a really good starting point. Obviously, uh, he mentioned in the interview Challenging Apollo, which is obviously a lot more detailed and being updated, which is fantastic. Can't wait for that. Yeah. 
this is going to be a, like you have to get this one Absolutely. when it comes out. I'm looking forward to that. But this is definitely uh, a really good starting point. So if anyone wants to know more about the Soviet space program, this is where you need to be. Uh, and, and definitely, definitely check out this latest book by Colin Burgess. Obviously, everything will be in the show notes. It's really hard at the moment. I, I wanted to keep this bit brief, but I, I feel like this has to be said. Obviously, we're coming up to well, I think it's this week, the year anniversary of Russia attacking Ukraine. And last year when all this was happening, it was it was difficult to know how to ca- cover that in terms of space flight when you were talking about anything Russian. And it feels odd that we're kind of talking about, and I have a few times talked about celebrating Soviet achievements in space when Russia at the moment is really hard to support anything they're doing. And, you know, they're mm-hmm. getting boycotted from everything sporting wise and culturally and things like that. I think it's really difficult to know how to, how to deal with that kind of thing when talking about his history and we don't judge. I don't judge more than Germans on the fact that you've got the world wars. And I know analyzing that, it's really a basic thing, but the, the people in those countries have a certain amount of guilt about that. I don't have to judge them on that. It's not down to me. And then they're completely different. And and the Soviet achievements are obviously completely different to the current regime. And that doesn't mean that I'm also glossing over bad things that Soviets have done. But there, there is a, there's a whole conversation to be had, and it's hard to have it right now, about the fact that communism is a dirty word in America, a really dirty word. Mm-hmm. And therefore, it's really hard to ever say the Soviet Union did some good things. Not all of it was good. They did some really bad stuff as well. But democracies have also done really bad things in their time as well. But it might seem odd that on the anniversary of Russia invading Ukraine, we're doing a show talking about Soviets. And I just wanted to bring up that it is a different thing and there is a very different conversation that needs to be had at various times. And what we're trying to do is celebrate the... The, 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 the successes, as I said earlier, 40 space firsts were com- completed by the Soviet Union. And a lot of them were really big things. And that they yeah. deserve to be uh, applauded for those things because they pushed other people to do other things and continue to as well. Their achievements continue to drive s- us forward in spaceflight. And I think... That is important. When we're just focusing just on space flight, let's forget the nuance and other political things. I think you have to accept that they were a big part and still are yeah. as Russia. You don't have to love somebody's government, but you can respect their their space flight program's achievements. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I just wanted to say that. I suppose there's a, there's, it's a similar debate to separating art from the artist, I guess. But anyway, yeah, the full unedited interview with Colin Burgess, which was a great interview, will be up on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. So, Emily, what's caught your eye since last week in the world of space flight? One thing that did catch my eye this week was um, the passing of Hugh Harris uh, at age 90. Uh, It caught me kind of off guard because Harris was really active up until his death. He did a lot of shows with the the American Space Museum for their Stay Curious series that they do uh, Mm -hmm. every day. So he was really pretty active up until his passing, unfortunately. But uh, we would like to wish his family and his friends and his colleagues uh, deepest condolences. But um, if you do not know... Hugh Harris basically, for me, was like the the voice of NASA for the 80s. He was the uh, PAO, the public affairs officer for uh, Space Shuttle STS-1 mission. If you watch the Space Shuttle launches through the 80s, that was basically the voice that got you through them. So uh, really just an icon of, of space flight and space history in general. He will be hugely missed. I, I do think I met him over 10 years ago at a at a, a Kennedy Space Center event. He was there as well as Jack King was there as well. So oh, wow. Yeah, I know. I got to meet some pretty big icons that day. Yeah. I'm very a I little mean, they, humbled. They are the two voices, aren't they? 
between yeah. the two of them, that's it, really, isn't it? Yeah, those are the ones that you probably remember the most if you were into Apollo in the shuttle and, and things like that. So really, it was an honor to even be in the same room with those guys at all. <laughs> I mean, just, just pretty incredible. I didn't really get an opportunity to talk to them because I was kind of... <laughs> I'll be real. I was intimidated <laughs> as yeah, hell. Yeah. I was like, these guys are giants. But um, no, they were. They talked to us for a while. They were very kind, and uh, we certainly heard a lot about space and and space history as as it pertained to Kennedy Space Center during that time. So yeah, like I said, let's salute his greatness. And he was like I said, he was very active up until his passing in the space community. So um, he will be missed. And yeah, that's absolutely. really what I've what I've got for this week. I, I love the fact he was so active till the end as well. I think that was great. Yeah, he was 90 and he just yeah. was, he just kept going, <laughs> yeah. which is awesome. He uh, kept going until, you know, until he couldn't. So like I said, I, he did a lot of things locally in Brevard County with the community and he was still, like I said, he was still at it. So yeah, but hey, that's how you want to go out on top. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So what about you, Dave? What have you been looking at this week? There is a fundraiser going on right now, which I want to draw people's attention to, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, You may remember, listeners, when we interviewed Serena about taking up space, the astronaut-supported NGO, which aims to inspire a generation of young native girls to get involved with science and engineering through spaceflight. And uh, in the past, they've funded girls going to space camp and other activities like that but they've got some new opportunities to go to some new events and to take the current students that they have and their mentors to these events is very expensive so they're trying to raise uh close to four thousand dollars and they've got about 14 days left to try and raise this at the moment they've done about half of that which is great Uh, so i'll put a link in the description if if you want to support this uh, I think I know it would be greatly appreciated by them and the, and these students who are doing great things and hopefully are going to do great things in the future, uh, but also be appreciated by us because we think this is one of the, the, the great things that happens within our community, these kind of endeavours. We love this stuff. Uh, and yeah. Thank you, Serena, for continuing to, to do it with these students. It's really um, awesome to see the community come together and band together to help the future, which is Awesome. I think that's really what it's all about. And Zarina's really done an incredible job with this. So like Dave said, please uh, consider donating and supporting them. Absolutely. So obviously link will be in the show notes. Please do go and check that one out. When you're a little girl growing up in Akron, Ohio, did you say, gee, I'd like to be an astronaut someday? No, I really didn't think about it until about four years ago when NASA announced that they were looking for astronauts who would be uh engineers and scientists on the space shuttle and it was accidental that I heard about it and I just took a chance and applied. Okay, thanks for listening this week. We hope that you've enjoyed what we've put together and we hope that you join us again next week. For the first time in a while, we've got multiple interviews in the diary, which is exciting for us and hopefully means lots of good things for you to look forward to. Please consider spreading the word among your spaceflight-loving friends or recommending us to anyone you meet who likes spaceflight. We've still got some t-shirts and things left on our website, so check that out at spaceandthingspodcast.com slash merch. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.